the heterogeneous integration group in IPIC, and then also the PIAD CDT cohort between Tyndall, uh, Belfast, and Glasgow. So uh, before this, I was a RD engineer uh, at what was uh, Oclaro in the UK, since now Lumentum. Um, and then before that, I did my uh, master's in Tyndall again uh, in Brian Corbett's group on integrated gas lasers and photo detectors. Um, then before that, I did my undergrad in, in Dublin. So that's me. Um, this is my group. Uh, so Owen is the group leader, Owen O'Reilly. Uh, the group is mostly focused on uh, modeling electronic uh, parameters in semiconductors. So it's actually a bit different from from uh, from what I'm showing showing today. Um, yeah, so in this presentation, I'm going to cover the motivation for the work, uh, some background theory. Um, I'm also going to include a comparison with a DBR distribution Bragg reflector laser. Um, just to kind of help the understanding, and then a bit of an overview of solid Fabry Perot lasers, uh, an introduction to inverse scattering, and uh, the inverse problem that we're applying here. And then a look at our optimization in terms of what we have done up until now in terms of optimizing the frequency selectivity, and then our new method where we look at optimizing the gain impact. And uh, then we're going to look at uh, some results from some Fourier analysis and some scattering matrix method, method results. Um, yeah, so our motivation is fairly clear. Um, we can, uh, well, it looks as if we can get quite a quite an improvement on um, uh, laser performance from implementing this new method in terms of the inverse inverse scattering um, design. Um, then, kind of further down the road from this is it, it has a kind of a knock on of, well, it has a targeted effect on improving the SMSOR line width and temperature stability. Um, yes, yeah, so what we're doing, really looking at is uh, improving the SMSOR of the lasers. So it's the spectral purity um, that pushes more energy into our chosen mode. Um, and then this is a lot of trickle down improvements across most most performance parameters of the laser. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a kind of what I've termed a traditional distributed Bragg reflector laser. Um, you can see the uh, selectivity is provided by this grating and it's it's external to the cavity. Um, so as the light comes out and interacts with this grating and your chosen wavelength gets reflected back in for stimulated emission. Um, you can change the design of the grating by changing the pitch of this, or change the design of the laser in terms of your, your wavelength uh, by changing the pitch and the uh, refractive index of this grating here. So this is our laser, the one we're specifically looking at. Uh, it's a slotted Fabry Perot laser. So instead of having an external grating, your grating is along the laser gain region. Um, so we introduced these slots uh, along the cavity uh, and they allow for frequency selection and mode selection. Um, so the DBR laser, the mirror is the grating, whereas in R1, our slots are interacting with our with our facet or facet mirror. Um, so the mechanism is, is a bit different on how the laser operates. Um, the basis of our approach is an inverse problem, which is apparently it's quite common in optics. So if you want to project an image that you want, you take that image and you perform an inverse Fourier transform to give you the E field that you want at the source and what kind of pattern you need at the source. Um, so then the projection performs a Fourier transform and gives you then your original desired pattern. Um, for our laser, we're looking at controlling the frequency of the spectrum. So we're doing, uh, we're looking at changing the pattern longitudinally in the laser because that will, that, will, that will affect the frequency. Um, so yeah, so our slotted Fabry Perot devices, um, the idea is to introduce these small defects or slots along the cavity of the device 
and um, provided these slots are sufficiently small, it it becomes a perturbation of the it becomes a, it becomes in the perturbation regime, which is then used in the design. Uh, you can change the impact of the slots by increasing their size or changing their position in the cavity. This is quite important because this is kind of what we're going to focus on. So remember that. Um, yeah, then uh, kind of fundamentally, this is what's happening in the laser cavity. Uh, when you introduce a slot, you you make it you you try to make a quarter wavelength ideally. So that leaves you one wavelength section that's half wavelength. So that's um, you know half wavelength uh, will give you kind of good, good feedback and will return the pattern quite well. But then it'll give you this other section quarter quarter wavelength, which is uh, which is destructive interference, and then your net gain is going to be the comparison of the length of your half wavelength section to your quarter wavelength section. Um, so then you can kind of infer from that that if you put a slot right at the middle of the laser cavity, that slot will have very little impact on the outcome of the of the gain spectrum. Uh, yes, as I've said, we're looking at optimizing the design. Um, there's two things you can optimize. Essentially, you can optimize the frequency selectivity of your grating, or you can optimize the impact that the slots are having in your grating. Um, because it's a perturbed regime, you get a linear combination of your uh, the function from your fabi perro cavity and then the function from your grating that you've introduced. Um, and then we actually design, you design the slot positioning by taking a weighted uh, sampling function of your kind of desired input function. Um, yeah, or change then this delta delta gamma. Uh, as I said, you can change the frequency and the magnitude by changing its position in the, in the cavity. Um, yes, our existing method is optimized in terms of frequency. Um, we've sele it was selected the sync function was selected because the sync function is ideal. You get a uh, selectivity of one at your chosen mode, and then all other modes are zero uh, selectivity. Um, so yeah, we can see the sync, sync function here on the left. <laughs> then the inverse Fourier or the Fourier transform, inverse Fourier transform of the sync, sync function is this top hat function, which is just one along the cavity length, um, and then zero everywhere else outside it. Um, now then we have to apply our weighting to this uh, to account for the, the, the fact it's in a fabric perro cavity. And when you apply the weighting, you get uh, something like this. Actually, this has a, a second order effect applied, which isn't important for this presentation, but this is the weighting function that was originally used. So you can imagine if you're sampling that, you're gonna get a lot of slots here towards the center of the cavity where they're having minimal impact on the gain. Uh, yeah, so a mathematical equation to represent that gain effect in position is this. Uh, cinch, cinch function. So if you think back to the quarter wavelength, half wavelength diagram, uh, if you're moving back and forth, you're moving up and up and down along this cinch, um, cinch function. So then this is the weighting effect. Uh, you divide everything by cinch, and that gives you your final uh, sample, sampleable function. So what we've done is we've taken this other function instead of the top hat f epsilon f epsilon equals one we've taken f epsilon equals the modulus of epsilon so it gives you this uh, increasing slope and um, which helps to average out the function um, and starts to redistribute slots towards the end of the cavity where they have a much greater impact and you can see there this this final function is a lot more linear um, I just say, yeah, I suppose you should note the, the range of values here on the left. So it's quite linear, this, this function. Um, then the downside, or just one potential downside is you do start to excite uh, modes, the nearest neighbor modes, left and right of the main, of the chosen mode. Um, but your net selectivity is improved. So yeah, this is, this, this is the final um, slot distribution for both functions. So again, you can see that our updated function has a lot less slots towards the center. So 
uh, each of the thoughts is having a much greater impact on the gain. Uh, this is a Fourier analysis of the two functions or the two slot distributions. Uh, our green one is our new one, and you can see there it's improvement over the existing blue um, Fe equals one method. So our selectivity is improved, and particularly our suppression at the mode edges or the gain band edges is 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 improved uh, quite a bit. Um, so I, I took those two slot structures and I passed them into a TMM where I had gain applied uh, just to get a sense of the um, how the two gratings were working or just to support the previous modeling. Um, so again, you can see that uh, this green function or Fe equals Z has a much greater mode control across the band and it appears to reach threshold uh, at a lower at a lower gain. So it supports our, our previous Fourier analysis. Um, yeah, so as I've said, our mode control over the band is improved, uh, particularly our mode control at the band edges. Um, so this actually, it's the main uh, benefit of this is going to be thermal stability. Uh, so if our gain band starts to move with temperature, we don't start to excite modes at the gain band edge like we would have with the previous function. Um, yeah, as I've said, we can see all these benefits and yeah, hopefully we can optimize further in the future. Um, that's, that's everything.